Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Bingo, two o'clock block. This is Think Tech. This is History Lens yes. with John David Ann. We love to talk to him about history. And today, because uh, it's just a day after Veterans Day, 100 years after the armistice right, ending right. uh, World War I, we're going to yes. talk about World War I. Right. We're going to talk about how it started, how it proceeded, how it ended, and the lessons for humanity, really, right. that, that we right. learned. Yes. Yeah, good. But, but I'd like to open with one thing, try to get you to talk about this. Yeah. Uh, Bismarck. Um, put Germany together from a bunch of duchies right. back in the 1870s. Right, that's true, yeah. And it was, what, 30 years, 35 years after he did that, uh, that we had Germany as a, you know, uh, yeah. an integrated country yeah. um, with everybody working together with yeah, a big national uh, war plan affair. Yes, that's uh, true. That covered all possibilities around yes. Europe. There was, it was like a computer program. If then, if that's this, true. then yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. The um, Schlieffen Plan of 1905, that's correct. So, so they were doing that for so, a while. That's true. General Schlieffen was, uh, he was the commanding general of the German army, and he put together this plan that in case there was an attack, in case uh, it looked like war, then Germany would attack to the west, they would conquer France, and then they would wheel their army very quickly and head to the Eastern Front and attack uh, Russia. Whoa, oh, that's pretty ambitious. Oh, it was a think. very ambitious plan. In the event itself, it didn't actually work. But, yeah. uh, but, but that was, was the mood. That was the that mood, was the mood that? right. And, and right. it wasn't just Germany. It, it seemed was, it like Europe it, in general. That's right. It seemed like it wasn't a question of whether or not there would be war. It was more a question of when. Yeah. Most European powers assumed there would be a war uh, by 1912, 1913. Interesting. Yeah, so... Uh, it was, so killing the Archduke in Serbia was that's just a, right. It was like the uh, the, the, the Tonkin <laughs> Gulf incident, right? Or, right. So or the sinking of the Maine, or exactly. No, 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 that's right. Like the Pearl Harbor, Pearl <laughs> Harbor incident. Yeah, with the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, which started the Pacific War. So yeah, we can actually bring up Franz and his wife, Franz Ferdinand. Um, there he is. That's Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian throne, and his wife. Uh, Sophie Chotek, and they're actually in Sarajevo. Uh, this is uh, uh, June 1914. And uh, the Archduke and his, uh, and his wife are there to welcome Bosnia into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, the, the, the Austrians claimed this as a part of their empire in, in 1908. It had been a part of the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman, Ottoman Empire is falling apart, and then, uh, then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Austrians claimed it. Now, this enraged the Serbians, who had their own state. Ser the state of Serbia was independent as of 1873. And the Serbians, there were a lot of Serbians living in Bosnia. And the Serbians had this idea in, in 1912 and 1913. They actually fought a couple of wars in, that, in the Balkans to promote this idea of conquering areas where Serbians lived outside of Serbia and making it a greater Serbia for ethnic Serbs. Mm. So there was this very strong, you see this in Russia today actually, in its actions in Crimea and in uh, you know, some other areas in, that, in the Ukraine where uh, the Russians have this idea of a greater Russia where you, you know, these ethnic Russians. Anyway, that's part of the prelude to the war and so Sophie and her husband are there to welcome uh, Sarajevo and the, and the Bosnians into the Austrian Empire, and quite a welcome they get. <laughs> so a <laughs> little, little bit of a story. So, so at this time, the European powers are poised against one another. I mean, you have the, the Russians and the French have signed a secret treaty by which they're going to defend one another in the case of a war. The Germans and the Austrians signed the same kind of secret treaty. And then later on, the, the, uh, the English joined the French and the, and the Russians. And later on, the Italians joined first the Germans and the Austrians. And then when the war goes badly, they switch sides. <laughs> and they join the Allies. So you got to have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a brutal, devastating Tragic. war. Yeah. You know, it's hard to keep your sense of humor. But... Uh, so, so they're riding in this car through Sarajevo, and this bomb goes off in front of them. No one is, well, there are some people injured, but they are unharmed. 
So they, they take off to the hospital to go visit these, uh, these injured. And, and then uh, they're going to go back into the crowd and, and back into the celebrations. And, and so they're on the street lined with people, right? Imagine this situation where the, there are throngs of crowds waiting for these two. And, uh, and the driver takes a wrong turn. It's true. He takes the wrong turn, and now the car has to back up in the midst of these throngs. And in, this car does not have reverse. You could bring the car up. Why don't we see a picture of the car? <laughs> there it is. It's a, it's a 1913 staff, uh, a stiffened graph. And it doesn't have a reverse gear. So in that case, the security guards had to jump out and push the car backward. Well, it just so happened that at that moment, uh, the Serbian nationalist who was there to kill the two of them stood right next to them as the car was being pushed backwards. And that's how they died. And, and that's, he shot them. It shot them both dead. And, uh, and uh, that's how then some other machinations, uh, the, the Austrians threatened the Serbians, and then the Austrians go to war against the Serbians. And then because the Serbians are allied with the Russians, the Russians mobilize against the Germans and the Austrians. Uh, the, the Germans then mobilize against the French. The French mobilize against the Germans. The English join the French. And all of a sudden, you know, Dominoes. you have World War I exploding into, yeah. into reality. Yeah, it's quite a beginning. And, the, and this all happened fairly quickly, no? That's right. In, in, in the space of from June to the end of July, 1914, then, and there were some attempts to stop the war. Uh, the Kaiser called for a peace conference in London. Uh, the British Foreign Secretary, Lord uh, Grey, was interested for a while and then saw that the hawks, the war hawks in England, didn't want a peace conference and then backed down. So the war, uh, so, so one of the lessons from World War I is that uh, people should actually have the peace conference <laughs> instead of going to war. Um, the, the causes of the war were this, you know, this intense uh, treaty system, uh, the, the mobilization, the plans for mobilization, as Jay, as you mentioned. And then there was this, there was competition over, over weaponry. There was an arms race that took place in the 1910s and teens, uh, uh, the 1900s and 10s, uh, and then there was uh, imperial competition. There was competition over colonies in Africa and elsewhere. Mm. Imperialism was riding high worldwide. Imperialism was part of the causes of the war. So you put that all together and then you have this horrible, horrible conflagration. Uh, you have uh, trench warfare. We've got a picture of the, the guys in the yeah. trench. There they are. And uh, th these things, the, tr the trenches were absolutely awful in World War I because wow. uh, they harbored disease. They had rats. There were all kinds of rats in the trenches, and the, were, uh, the, the rats were uh, disease-ridden. So it was a very uh, dangerous environment of, of millions upon millions of men died just from being in the trenches. And the trenches filled up with water. So the, these trenches were located in the lowlands area, in Belgium, uh, in uh, the, the Netherlands. And uh, the, the, in, the, in the fall, especially in the fall and the winter, then there was lots of rain. That area gets all kinds of rain that time of year. So the trenches would fill up with water, and these soldiers standing in that water all the time, and their feet would, would begin to rot away. Yeah. That's what trench foot is. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, it was, yeah, it's a form of gangrene. But you know why this is a sort of an odd way to do war. Yeah, you find a trench and you stay in there, and then and then <laughs> and then an officer tells you to run over the hill, and and you get mowed down by a machine yeah, gun. Yeah, right, right. What kind of a way is that to spend your yeah, day? Yeah, uh, it doesn't it doesn't sound like a really effective military strategy. Yeah, okay, no? good good question. So the war itself is fought on with the assumption that it'll be like wars in the past. It'll be like the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the invasion of France, the Franco-Prussian War of 1870. Or it'll be like the American Civil War, where, where soldiers still lined up uh, maybe 400 to 500 yards apart from one another, and they charged one another. And uh, the weaponry was such that if you stood uh, 400 yards away from your opponent, then the field cannon 
couldn't, they could reach about that, but not much farther. So you mm. could stand a little bit beyond the reach of the field cannon, and, and you could actually, you know, gather your troops there and be pretty much unharmed. Uh, the, the basic musket in the Civil War, uh, that musket ball flew about 80 yards. So you didn't have to worry about long-range snipers much or the rest of it. Uh, but technology really changes, of course, right? We all know this, that the technology, uh, the killing technology dramatically increases in the late 19th century, early 20th century, so that now you have artillery that can throw shells 25 miles, not just 400 yards. And you have uh, uh, rifled weapons that can throw a bullet, uh, you know, uh, three, 4,000 yards, a mile even. So, the, and then you have the machine gun, you have the introduction of the tank at the end of the war, uh, less influential but still important. And so you have all these killing devices which are just including much more the effective. airplanes. The airplanes, with machine can, guns can, on them. Can, can drop bombs. Bombs. Um, so, yeah, you have, so the technology increases, but the, the way of fighting does not change. Well, you and know that's why you have this like. intense slaughter. It sounds, you know, before the range was limited. Right. Uh, now the range obviously was much greater. Right. So what do you do to avoid being pulverized by weapons that go further? You right. dig a hole. You dig trenches. And that's, that's exactly the way you right. ostensibly protect your troops yeah. against that greater firepower. That's right. Yeah. But it really didn't work very well. No, it was awful. It was a slaughterhouse. And, and the old idea of a charge, an offensive charge, uh, was still there. And that was a very bad idea because uh, you could much easier, m much more easily defend yourself in a trench than you could by sending your men over the trench into that, the so-called no man's land between the German trenches and the American trenches. Or so, pardon me, the, you know, the I have, Allied I have a question. Yeah. So 1914 is summer of 19... Right. 14 and the guns of August, you know, yes, uh, yes. a few weeks after Barbara that period Tuchman's is book, the Barbara guns Tuchman. Of August, yes. um, okay, so then we, we have a war and, it, uh, you know, House of Cards comes down, everybody's shooting each other. Right. They spend years in trenches right. between 1914, 1917. Yeah. Okay, then les Américains. <laughs> we arrive, yes, you know, right. and we, we have right. issues about going into the war or not, right. and there were things that provoked us to going into the war. That's true, yes. Um, and yes. finally, we get there, uh, yep. and yep. Uh, we're singing songs and uh, yes. being being happy and confident and all that. Well, did happy we, unless you get mowed down. Unless you get machine. mowed down, which happens shortly thereafter. Yep. Um, did we actually make a difference? Did we oh, win yeah. the war for yeah. them? So this is the traditional interpretation of the end of the war. Um, the United States declares war on, on uh, uh, Germany in 1917, and the reason why they do this is because Germany at the beginning of the war had pursued unrestricted submarine warfare. And in early 1915, they, sank, they sink a cruise ship called the Lusitania. Uh, and a lot of Americans— it's a cruise ship with passengers That's right. Passengers well, it was, it. Yeah, it was a cruise ship that had been outfitted to bring war supplies okay. to England. It wasn't uh, like uh, machine guns and stuff, but uh, medical supplies and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and the, and uh, so it was considered to be a civilian ship at that point, and the Germans sank it. And uh, they lost a life, lots of lots of people. That's right, died. thousand, more yeah. than a thousand yeah. people yeah. died. And uh, uh, so the United States issues an ultimatum at that point, says to Germany, look, you do this again and we're going to join the war. And Germany backs down and says, okay, we, re we will from now on renounce unrestricted submarine warfare. We will only target combatants. And that lasts for, uh, you know, for about a year and a half. And then in early 1917, the problem is the United States has said it's going to be neutral in, you know, in attitude and in reality, and in reality it's not neutral. We're sending a lot of money England's way, we're sending material, and eventually we begin to send uh, war material to the British, much needed by the British. And so uh, the, the German high command looks at this and they say, you know what, we're, we're not winning the war. This is a problem for us, and the Americans are busy helping the British stay afloat. So we've got to go back and we've got to do some more uh, damage in the Atlantic Ocean. So they resume unrestricted warfare. 
unrestricted submarine. To war. try to stop the in, flow of material that's right, and all in, that. in 19 in early 1917. And this is really puts the United States on something close to a war footing. Then in April uh, 1917, the United States intercepts a telegram, a telegram that was intended for the German ambassador to Mexico. Hold on. Okay. You know, I, I'm getting that cliffhanger <laughs> feeling all over me. Yes. That's John David Dan, okay. history professor. We have a cliffhanger. We'll, we'll talk about we'll the telegram. We'll take a short break. We we're going we're gonna, to we're find out right. exactly what that telegram said because that was <laughs> instrumental in the United States entry into World War One. Right, right, okay. Right. Oh, true. wow. Yes. We'll be right yes. back. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. Okay, we're back with John David Ann, and as we left this exciting story about World War I, there was a, a certain telegram <laughs> right. that changed the course of history. The so-called Zim Zimmerman, Zimmerman telegram. All right, yes. John, what's in Zimmerman the Zimmerman was the German foreign minister, yeah. sent a telegram to his ambassador in Mexico, only it was intercepted. It got lost and then was intercepted, ended up in the hands of the American government. The telegram promised Mexico its old territory in the United States, California, New oh, Mexico, Arizona, oh, parts of Utah, parts of Colorado. Yeah, it promised that territory to, uh, to Mexico if Mexico would attack the United States. <laughs> yeah, so this was the last straw. And this is when, when uh, the United States declared it's funny war. how a piece of yeah. paper like that. that. That's right. Which was really silly when you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. No, it wasn't going to happen. It was a, that was a real long shot. So, um, And so this made people wild and crazy. And up to that point, I mean, I remember that a, a large percentage of the immigrants who then right. populated the country right. were German. That's right. From the last half no, of the 19th absolutely, century. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a lot of discrimination against Germans in World War One. Yeah. Um, you know, German, the language is banned in public places in Iowa. Uh, there are, you know, Germans are lynched, actually killed by vigilante mobs. Um, wow. At the same German, time, there were also German, German spies. Farmers there were German who, spies yeah, well, operating no, in the U.S. No, honestly, not enough. much. No, it was okay, mostly right. that fake, was fake mostly news, yeah, yeah fabric, <laughs> serious. That was mostly fabrication and fear. Right, fear fueled this anti-German attitude. So, um, the the director of the Boston Symphony Orchestra was a German, a German national, but he was a harmless guy. But he got interned. He got put into an internment camp. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Sh there, shades of today. Yeah, well, there was this war fever going on in the United States. Yeah, shades but, of World War II, but, uh, also. Yeah. So that's the domestic side. On the international side, then it takes the United States a year to put its army together. The United States has a very small army, and they're not prepared. So it's not until spring 1918 that the United States actually sends a fighting force to Europe. So they had let their army. The U.S. had let its army decline. After the Spanish-American War, is that oh what yeah, happened? after after the not Civil important. War and the Spanish, that's right. Yeah. It was not very big even during the Spanish-American War. Okay, so they had to ramp all of that up and ramp up war production and the rest of it. So uh, there is this mobilization, and then troops are sent in spring uh, 1918, and the American troops are fresh. The thing about this war is it ground everybody down. It was such a vicious war. In one day, I believe in 1916, the British decide upon an offensive. And they send their troops over the trenches into battle. They uh, lose 60,000 men in one day, killed. Uh, and the, the line of battle does not move an inch. So, so, so there's this, it's really a slaughterhouse. 
And it leads to uh, this, the, just this war exhaustion on the part of uh, the British, the French, and then, of course, the Germans on the Western Front. And uh, the United States come in, comes in, its, its troops are fresh, uh, the United St and, and the, uh, the Americans have access to tanks, French tanks. And, uh, and the Americans, I think, really make the difference, because the Germans are planning a big offensive in the spring and summer of 1918. The Americans fight that offensive off. There are high American casualties in that time period. And then in the late summer of 1918, they begin to push the German army back beyond the trenches towards the German boundary. Mm -hmm. And when, when the German army has to retreat back into its own homeland, then uh, the high command of Hindenburg and Ludendorff, they realize the gig is up. And that's when they sue for an armistice. And that's the day that we celebrated a couple of days ago on the 11th. It's 11, 11, 1918. Mm. Mm. That's right. So, so, but but this was an armistice. This, there's a lesson in the armistice too, right, isn't there? Right. If That's you right. humiliate a country, of you're going to pay a price later. Yeah. 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 What and, was the humiliation? Yeah. So, 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 of course, the it's complicated. History is complicated. <laughs> I'll agree with that. <laughs> so, uh, what happens is the the Germans don't just say, "Okay, we're done." They actually have a plan. The plan is to contact Woodrow Wilson, the American president who has put forward a plan for the peace after the war called the 14 points. Mm, yeah. Some of those points say there, there should be no punishment to anyone in the war. Uh, there should be no victors. To, there should be peace without victory. That's, what, that's Wilson's slogan. So the Germans like this idea because they're losing now, <laughs> right? No punishment for the losers. Uh, and so they contact Wilson. And Wilson uh, wants to put forward his 14 points. But the Allied powers, the French and the British, they're not interested in this. They're interested in blood. Because they lost millions of their, their soldiers, millions of their men. They lost so much in money. Had, had the Germans done you know, really brutal things in the war, you know, more than the others? Had there been war crimes? Had, had there been yeah. genocide? Had yeah. there been well, I think the crimes biggest, against civilians? You know, in general, no, but the Germans did use gas. Ah. They used a, a sarin gas, which was brand new, invented by a German Jew, uh, Fritz Haber. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they used it. They used it against— As opposed uh, to the others. The others did not use well, it. Well, they didn't have it. The other allies didn't have this, at least at the outset. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, that, that was definitely—that uh, that could be considered a war crime. Um, so so the, Brit, yeah. the, the Brits were ticked off at them. For well, it wasn't just the Brits. The French lost 25 percent of their young men, uh, 25, pardon me, 25 percent of their male population. Mm -hmm. So for a generation, you think about this, the young men would have married, had babies, had productive lives. That was taken away from the French. Uh, so yeah, the French and the British were outraged. They didn't want any Wilsonian principles. So Wilson had to go back to the Germans and say, you know what, the 14 points are not going to work. We're going to accept your unconditional surrender, and we're going to accept the abdication of the Kaiser. This is the German king, Kaiser Wilhelm. So the Allies were asking a lot, but the Allies essentially had agreed, and Wilson agreed with this as well, that they were not going to negotiate with the Kaiser. The Kaiser had to be gone. And eventually the Germans agreed to this. They, they don't really have a choice. Uh, so it goes back and forth in uh, the middle of October and the end of October. And then finally there's an agreement. Uh, the Germans sign the armistice. And we can, we've I've actually got a picture of the armistice uh, train car. So this is a picture of the car, the train car in which the armistice was signed. Right there in the front is General Falk. Uh, pardon my language, but that's how it's pronounced in French. Uh, he's, he's basically the commander of the Allied forces. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, he's, so he's there, and then you have some, some German commanders on the left, and, and uh, you have some other officials. But the signing takes place in this car about, I think, about uh, 10 a.m. in the morning. Interesting tidbit, Hitler, when he conquers France, there's this car still exists. He gets a hold of this same carriage, this same train carriage, and he forces the the French to sign their surrender in the same car. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. it, it burned um, 
it, it okay. burned it uh, burned. Germany. Yeah. That, that armistice was uh, was really hard on them. Well, At least they saw <clears> it that way. Well, and, so it, it, so it wasn't the armistice so much. It was the peace afterwards. It was the treaty okay. that was negotiated in the winter and spring of 1919, signed in June 1919. And uh, the Germans did not have a place at that table, the negotiating table. And uh, the Germans' uh, Wilsonian ideas were pushed aside by the Allied powers. Um, Those are the high, lofty I ideals of a, a better world. That's right. Internationalism, uh, uh, no punishment for the Germans, no reparations for the Germans. Uh, you know, so, so that was put aside. And there's actually a clause in the Versailles Treaty that states that the Germans were responsible for the end of the war, for, for, pardon me, for starting the war. Wow. Yeah, so, so it was definitely blame the Germans at that point. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and the, the Allied powers uh, negotiated reparations, so the Germans actually had to pay reparations now, uh, significant reparations. If the Germans had paid all of the reparations, they would have paid about $33 billion. Wow which is this enormous sum of money. Especially in those three, days. Yeah. Three times the, the GDP of the German economy <laughs> before the war. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so it was this, uh, the, the Versailles Treaty document really deeply punished the Germans. It humiliated them, and it created the seeds for the rise of Nazism and uh, the, 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 uh, the, the rise of, of uh, World War II, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, was, it was a peace with victors and losers. Uh, Wilson's internationalist idea just were, were pretty much thrown out of the treaty. Mm. Um, and so that's really one and of the, the takeaways. The League of Nations had no significant The, the League effect. of Nations hadn't been created yet, so it was created out of the treaty. Uh, but uh, the, nonetheless, the, the provisions of the treaty provided that Germany was strapped down like a, like a patient who wanted to leave but was, you know, strapped to the table. And uh, Germany had to pay its reparations every month. It ruined the German economy in the early 1920s. Germany ended up printing so much money that, uh, you know, to buy a loaf of bread would cost you about four million uh, uh, Deutschmarks or... Uh, uh, Reichsmarks, pardon me, um, and so it, it deeply damaged the Germans. And as I again, the the idea here, and I think this is quite true. The literature bears this out that uh, that Germans, the the punishment of the Germans led to uh, led to an opening for somebody who was a nationalist who said that treaty ruined us, and we're going to get our pride back. And that's what Hitler said. Mm. Um, and so that was a, it sounds like that was not a small cause of World War II, it was a significant I, one. I think that was the overlayment of World War II. Mm. It was this bitterness, this sense of bitterness. So if you them. want to look at how the, the, the treaty affected the rest of the 20th yes. century, it's yes. right there That's in the right. treaty. And, yes. and what's interesting about it is it could have gone to Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was at the negotiations. He was the chairman of the negotiations. But he couldn't convince the French and the British to, ne to negotiate along Wilsonian lines. Mm. Um, there was too much bitterness among their own population. And uh, 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 John Maynard Keynes, the famous economist, he was actually there as a part of the British uh, delegation. He so disagreed with the British approach of punishing the Germans that he quit the delegation, went home, wrote a book about it, and published the book within six weeks. It was called The Consequences of the Peace, and it predicted what would happen. Wow. It predicted that if you punish Germany, first of all, you would punish yourselves because Germany was the largest economy in Europe. So you couldn't trade with a Germany that was strapped, that was under duress. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he saw the economic chaos that the 20s and the 30s, that resulted from the treaty in the 20s and the 30s. So how, looking back, John, yeah. today, right. we've had, we've had uh, <clears throat> World War II, you know, we've had the whole effect of the greatest generation. We've had, um, right. Right. for a while, we had a pretty terrific economy. Yeah. Um, we had some smaller wars that demoralized us, Vietnam right. and all right. that. Um, and here we are in 2018. Yeah. It's uh, 100 years 100 later. Years, yeah. uh, how do we look back at this? 
Is this, I mean, we've sort of concluded that it, that yeah. it created in many ways World War II, and World War II really created the way things are today. Right. So, <clears throat> so how do we look back at yeah. this today? Yeah, so, so I think the paths that I was talking about, the Wilsonian path, well, uh, the European powers do not take that path after World War I, but the Americans do after World War II. They take the Wilsonian path. The Marshall this is, Plan. This is really a century created by Wilson. Uh, now, historians are still debating this, so some would disagree with me, but Woodrow Wilson's ideas drive American diplomacy and the American economy in the post-war period. Free trade, open diplomacy, um, um, you know, no secret agreements, uh, uh, kind of um, multilateral internationalism, the spread of democracy. So, so Wilson's ideas provided for all of that, and the Americans, with actually significant opposition, the Americans actually embraced the Wilsonian premises after World War II. It provided for unprecedented uh, prosperity in the late, you know, the second half of the 20th century. Um, it provided for uh, an internationalist environment in the world that, that kept the world safer than it would have been. Uh, multilateral agreements, the United Nations, of course, the, the precursor to the United Nations, the League of Nations was Wilson's idea. So it, it created a world that prospered and even though there were these conflicts that you mentioned, was still at peace. And so this is, this is quite a remarkable achievement. Mm -hmm. it, it came 30-some 30, 30 years later after Wilson. Mm -hmm. But it still was of, of a, a time that, uh, I, th I think we're still in this time, actually. Yeah, that's, I guess that would that's yeah. be a great takeaway from this whole discussion. Yeah. We're still in the same time. We're in the same bubble somehow yeah. from World War I. Yes. Um, and, yeah. I, you know, and people, uh, you and me included, have yeah. grown up in the notion uh, that the Second World War was the war to end all wars, even though Wilson intended the First World War Well, that's true, yes, wars. the Great War. Right? And we thought that never again, that the, you know, the brutality of the Second World was right. over, right. and that we would be able to go forward and, and create a better society, yeah. as he had imagined. Yeah. But it, it just seems to me that that's, a, that's kind of a fiction, a self-deception. Well, the fact is that the human race, the human species, yeah. can have really terrible wars. Uh, in, in that case, it was You're going to go dark on me, Jay? Yeah, I always do. Uh, <laughs> and here we are thinking, it'll be fine. Is it fine? Looking back at these two wars, John, is it fine? Yeah. Well, of course not. I mean, the wars were devastating. Millions of people died. Um, you know, you have the Holocaust in World War II. You have, you have uh, uh, between the wars, you have close to 70 million people uh, disappearing from the planet just uh, as casualties. So no, it's, it wasn't fine, it's awful. But I think my point is that we built a system after World War II that was, relatively speaking, a peace system, an internationalist system, a prosperous system economically. And that system, for all of its faults, has brought us to a time when we see unprecedented wealth in the world when we see unprecedented uh, uh, safety, even though there are wars, people are not dying in the millions from wars, uh, uh, an unprecedented stability in the world, in an international system led by the United States. So I think we should think long and carefully before we abandon that system. It seems that the Trump administration might be suggesting that we could go back to a time of tariffs and, you know, kind of a winner loser, zero sum, uh, which is not Wilsonian internationalism. But I think there's grave danger with that. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I think uh, uh, Trump, some of Trump's ideas are, are, are very dangerous and threaten that internationalist system that the United States has led since the end of World War II. Just to uh, add to that, there was a piece on. Uh, NPR this morning about yeah. the Center for Strategic and International Studies, right. where some fellow, Victor Cha is his name, and oh, yeah, he's sure. actually been on the think tech. Yeah. And uh, he did a study on North Korea yeah. and found that right. uh, since uh, Trump made his um, you know, diplomatic moves, that's, I, that's a euphemism, right. uh, and, and sort of made peace, uh, right. according to him, yeah. with Kim Jong-un. Yeah. Fact is that <clears throat> Kim Jong-un has continued making nuclear yeah, yeah. missiles. Yeah. 
And although he hasn't done any nuclear testing, right. uh, he's way ahead of where he was a few months That's ago. Right. That's right. So you say, you know, uh, sometimes it looks like we're in better shape, but actually uh, there are indications that we're not. Well, the, here's the thing. It, it, it is a piece that included uh, nuclear weapons, okay? And that part of the piece, part of the reason there was peace is because uh, the big countries, the, the superpowers, actually had a nuclear arsenal and, and didn't want the other guy to use it. And deterrence. So, so it created a, a kind of deterrence that we've never had before in the world, and I think prevented wars. Um, it's not the greatest kind of peace. It would be better to have a peace without nuclear, the nuclear threat, without nuclear weapons. On the other hand, that's where we're at today, and rather than having wars in which nuclear weapons could be used, we have a system in which nuclear weapons are stockpiled. I don't know. Well, you know, it's not great, Jay, but it's... it's I uh, think there were people in... Great, it could be a lot worse, let's say People in like Great that. Britain in, in the <laughs> late 30s or 40s yeah. uh, who believed that they, that World War I had, was concluded, that Wilson was right, that uh, reparations had settled the Germans down, yeah. uh, that they could enjoy their lives, um, you know, in a fine time, yeah. until the bombs came down from, when the V-2 rockets came yeah. down, yeah. and then they realized that it all caught up with them. Yeah. And, I, and I think the lesson, the takeaway for me, yeah. uh, is that you can't be complacent about this that the species does have war in its historical ah, past, okay, sure. and that we can live a great life and sit sure, in the studio yeah, 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 here, yeah. have a great time, enjoy, yes. our, enjoy our lives, but we cannot be sure that this sort of thing will not repeat. Your thoughts? No, sure, of course. Yeah, I mean, there's no guarantee that we won't have another world war. But I think uh, the, you know, the nuclear stockpiles do provide a tremendous deterrence. Yeah. Um, you know, will there be another war uh, in the future? Yet yeah, it, it's possible that we could have a world war, and might between might be between the United States and China, over the South China Sea or elsewhere. Let's hope not. But both the United States and China have nuclear weapons. So, what kind of a war would that be? Oh, you wouldn't even know it happened. <laughs> okay, that's a very dark. Okay. John, John, on that thank dark you so moment, much. John David we're done. Ed, history professor. <laughs> on that dark moment, we're done. <laughs> Happy Veterans Day. Yeah, thanks, Jim. <laughs>